Welcome to the, this session, Symposium 24, on the role of CFTR during epithelial development, differentiation and regeneration. This is a little bit different from most of the symposium we have and workshops we have so far at NACFC. So it's my pleasure to have as co-chair Sririam Vaidya Nathan. I hope that's your correct name. And by the way, my name is Margarita Maral, for those who don't know me. I'm also Margarita Maral for those who know me. So. <laughs> um, yeah, so my co-chair is um, introducing the, the session, so welcome. Um, so thanks, Dr. Amral, for that uh, introduction. Um, so as Dr. Amral mentioned, uh, so today we are looking at the role of CFTR in epithelial development, differentiation, and regeneration. And specifically, we're going to discuss the major developmental um, and differentiation defects of occurring in CF airways and describe potential therapeutic pathways to be rescued as we restore epithelial differentiation and regeneration defects in CF. And then we'll, I, we'll try to identify alterations in the epithelial cell composition resulting from the absence of functional CFTR. So those are our educational objectives. Uh, and then I'll give the mic back to Dr. Amaral to introduce the first speaker. Yeah. Yeah, that's the other option. Thank you so much. Yeah. So today we have a great panel of speakers, and the first one is David Stoltz from the University of Iowa, who, as you may have guessed, is going to talk about the pig, but on a different perspective. So we will have some insight into development and epithelial differentiation defects in CF airways, and as I said, lessons from the pig. Then we have, did you say CFTR in secretory cells? So that's a provocative title from Camille Ré from the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Next, we will have the presentation by my collaborator, Ines Panconian from the University of Lisbon. And Ines is going to tell you about the identification of genes restoring the CF regeneration defect. And last but not the least, we'll have Esther Vladar, who's going to talk about from the University of Colorado, Anschutz Medical Campus in Aurora. And uh, Esther is going to talk about characterization of airway epithelial differentiation in response to restored CFTR function. And um, as it has happened in our other sessions here, uh, we will leave the questions to the end where all speakers will come to the floor so that we have perhaps a more comprehensive and overall discussion about all the topics. So without further ado, I call David to the stage for the floor and I hope I can help you with the presentation opening. I guess that's it. So I've got some human data, too. I hope that's okay. Oh, that's All great. right. <laughs> so, good morning, everybody. Uh, and I'm grateful for the, the invitation to present this morning and grateful for everyone here today. Um, I would first like to start with a... The question, is cystic fibrosis a congenital or developmental disease or disorder? And I sort of want you just to think about in your, in your head what your answer to this would be. Um, if we look at WHO's definition of a congenital uh, disorder, it states congenital anomalies or disorders can be defined as structural or functional anomalies that occur during intrauterine life. These conditions develop prenatally and may be identified before or at birth or later in life. And I would argue that CF, if we think about the many different organs that are affected, we could think about CF as a developmental disorder. So if we go, just go through the list, we know that the sweat gland abnormalities are already present at birth. Reproductive tract abnormalities are present at birth, so about 95 plus percent 
of people with CF, lack of vas deferens that we think is uh, not present very early on. Subset of people with CF develop meconium ileus, again, which is an intrauterine process. The majority of kids who have pancreatic exocrine insufficiency have that already when they're born. A subset of kids with CF are born with liver disease, specifically focal biliary cirrhosis. And I think the big question is, are the airways abnormal at birth? And what I'd like to do in the next 20 minutes or so is to give you some evidence that I think they are abnormal in birth and to at least um, ask you to consider this um, as a possibility. So if I took 100 pulmonologists and asked them a simple question, is the CF lung normal at birth? I think the vast majority of them would say, yes, it is normal. And five saying no may even be an un overestimate, to be honest. But really, what I think the, the answer to that question is, I don't know. I don't think we know whether or not the CF lung is normal at birth or not. So my talk, I'm going to go over four areas. First, I'm going to describe to you some airway abnormal developmental abnormalities that are present at birth in CF pigs. Second, I'm going to show you some examples of similar findings that are observed in people with CF. Third, discuss some potential mechanisms. I'm going to tell you already, I don't think we understand how lack of CFTR directly affects airway development in utero. And finally, end with why might this be important. We've known that CFTR is expressed in fetal lung tissue uh, for a very long time. Here I'm showing you a couple different studies. Uh, the images you're seeing are essentially looking at CFTR M, uh, mRNA immunostaining. Uh, the white is positive for CFTR staining. Um, so you see a lot of it present in the first trimester. Interestingly, as you go through gestation, the amount of CFTR appears to decrease. Here's some additional immunostaining of human lungs at 18 weeks. You can see some CFTR present in the fetal lung and a similar staining pattern at 11 and a half weeks. The other thing we know is that it appears that CFTR sort of peaks early during gestation and then comes down over time. And these are some data from Dr. Ann Harris's group looking at CFTR mRNA levels in the sheep lung. And again, what you can see is that it comes up very early and then decreases by the time you get to actual delivery. We became interested in this area because one of the first things we noticed with the first litters of CF pigs was that their tracheas were abnormal. And we noticed this because we took the lungs and the trachea out of the animals, put a catheter in to lavage the lungs, and actually the catheter was sort of tight where it wasn't tight in the non-CF. And so here's an example of a trachea from a newborn uh, non-CF pig on the top, CF pig on the bottom. And one of the most striking things is that the caliber of the trachea is significantly redu reduced in a CF newborn pig compared to a non-CF. We went on to quantify this using a CAT scanner. And so here I'm showing you an example slice from a non-CF um, newborn pig lung, a CF pig lung, and essentially quantified how big the trachea was. And so here on the y-axis, I'm showing you airway area in millimeters squared, non-CF in blue, CF in orange. And what you could really appreciate is that the uh, diameter or the area of the newborn CF trachea is significantly reduced. The other thing we noticed is that these tracheas were irregularly shaped. And so here again are these, these same slices. And what we did was quantify something called circularity. So a, a, a shape that essentially resembles a perfect circle would have a value of one. Anything less circular has a smaller number. And what you can see when we quantify this is that the CF newborn tracheas were less circular or more irregularly shaped compared to the litter mate non-CF controls. The third thing we noticed was that the cartilage was abnormally shaped and developed. So here I'm showing you images that were taken with optical coherence tomography, where we put an imaging catheter down the middle of the trachea, reconstructed the images, and what you're seeing is the tracheal rings from a non-CF and a CF newborn pig. And a couple of things. The first is that you could see in the non-CF trachea, the rings are very evenly spaced and all about the same size, whereas in contrast to the CF, you can see they're irregularly spaced. They overlap. Some rings are big, some rings are small, some rings are short, some rings are long. We didn't really know that this happened in CF and actually went back and looked at the literature after our first litter of CF pigs were born. And back in 2008, similar tracheal abnormalities had been reported in CF mice. And so I'm just showing you two examples. The first here, you can see these abnormal tracheal cartilage rings, similar to what we saw in the pig. 
And then they also have this subglottic stenosis where the trachea has this, this narrowing present. Developmental abnormalities have also been reported in CF sheep and the CF uh, rat in terms of number of submucosal glands, size of submucosal glands, et cetera. So we first asked how far down the airway tree uh, is the airway size reduced? And so to do this, again, we went back to our CT scan images. So here's an example, reconstruction. Here's the trachea, right main stem bronchus, left main stem bronchus. And we're gonna go down the length of the right main stem bronchus and see is it smaller along the whole way, denoting each segment by a number here. And so again, area uh, of the airway on the y-axis. And as we go down the right main stem bronchus, you can see it's segment number one, right at the carina, it's significantly reduced. And as we look at what happens along the length of the right main stem bronchus, you can see that it tapers as expected, but CF is always smaller than non-CF. We wanted to look at more distal airways, but as you can see, this is about as much of the airway tree that we can get from a newborn pig lung in a human CAT scanner. And so we next moved to micro CT and focused on the tracheal lobe. So you cannot put the whole uh, newborn pig lung in a micro CT scanner. So we essentially dissected out the tracheal lobe. This is something unique to a pig. It's essentially the equivalent of the right upper lobe in humans, but the bronchus comes right here off the trachea, so you can nicely dissect it and cannulate that airway. So we took that out, we dissected it, we inflated it to a, a, a pressure of 20 centimeters of water, put it in the micro CT scan, essentially reconstructed the airway tree, and then measured it with some software. So here on the left, remember, this is about as much of the tracheal lobe that we could measure with the human CAT scanner in contrast to the type of airway tree that we get with the micro CT scanner. The porpoise lobe has a cranial branch and a caudal branch, and I'll talk about measurements along that. But you can see we can clearly um, visualize and enumerate many more airways than what we were able to do with the human CAT scanner. To give you an idea of how much of the airway tree we were able to capture, here I'm overlaying the micro CT image as this, the scanner's coming along, and you can see that these airways are extending out all the way to the pleural surface. So essentially we're measuring lots and lots of airways extending out to the periphery of the lung. So we started to quantify this. I'm gonna walk you through some different airway segments. The first airway we looked at was this main one, what's called the, the caudal lobe, denoted here by the red arrow. Again, looking at airway area on the y-axis. And as, again, as expected in non-CF, starts out at about two millimeters squared. And as you move along the length of this airway, it tapers. If we compare that to CF, you can see even at the starting value right here, CF is smaller than non-CF. Although the delta between non-CF and CF appears to narrow as you move down the airway tree. The next airway we looked at was the caudal branch one, which is this one in green. Again, at the beginning, non-CF and CF very different, but as you begin to taper, the difference between non-CF and CF begins to um, lessen. Another airway here in orange, CAB2, similar sort of thing, difference early on, as you move down, that difference becomes less. Interestingly, as we move further down the airway tree, so here now this one demoted, denoted by the blue arrow, really not a whole lot of difference between non-CF and CF, and very quickly, they're basically become superimposable. And a similar type of phenomena when we looked at this one in purple, essentially not much difference at all and goes down there. And so essentially what we're seeing is that there are very big differences between the non-CF and CF airway in the larger proximal airways, but as you move further down the airway tree, further down the length of the airway, that um, uh, difference becomes uh, less pronounced. And what we observed that was that at about 0 0.3 to 0.4 millimeters squared is about where we saw the difference between non-CF and CF essentially go away. So these data suggest that airway narrowing is re restricted to the large airways, and the narrowing dissipates as airways become smaller. So if you think about it, it's sort of interesting, because essentially, you know, sort of the big airways in this triangle are essentially the ones that we saw that were different. Whereas once you get outside of that triangle to smaller airways, you don't see that difference. If you think about how the airways in the lung develop, it's these larger, more proximal airways that are developing earlier during in utero development, as opposed to these smaller airways that are developing later in development, and I think that'll be important later. So based upon these measurements, our prediction was that distal airspace size 
um, and lung volumes would be similar between non-CF and CF. And so we used a couple different approaches to look at this. First, I'm showing you histology using mean linear intercept, which sort of gives you an idea of distal airspace size, and you can see no difference between non-CF and CF. And when we calculated alveolar surface area, no difference between non-CF and CF. We also looked at lung volume, and we did with this with the CAT scanner, um, inflating the lungs, uh, any animal, uh, or doing the scans at zero and 25 centimeters of water, and then calculating the lung volume. And you can see no difference in lung volume at zero centimeters of water or at 25 centimeters of water. So again, proximal airway is affected, but it does not appear that more distal airways are. So the obvious question then is, is this airway abnormality present in humans with CF? I don't think we know the definitive answer, but I'm gonna give you three examples of where um, I think we are seeing some, some differences. First is we did a retrospective review of chest CT scans that we had performed on kids with CF at the University of Iowa and looked at kids from age six months to two years of age. We looked at tracheal size and we also looked at tracheal shape. We did not see a difference between tracheal size between non-CF and CF, but when we looked at tracheal shape or circularity, you can see that the tracheas um, imaged in the CAT scanner from the kids with CF were significantly less circular or more irregularly shaped compared to the non-CF. We also did some, hist or reviewed some histology studies. So Sturgis and Emory in 1982 had actually reported a rather large data set of airway measurements from kids with and without CF. We went back and reanalyzed that data only focusing on infants less than two weeks of age because we wanted to try and study these children's airways before they probably had secondary consequences. So here's a table of that data. So we looked at gestational age, postnatal age, body length, airway lumen, and lumen divided by body length. And what we found was that despite the CF kids having a higher gestational age than the uh, non-CF kids, uh, postnatal age was increased, their body length was more, they on average had a lower airway lumen area in terms of the trachea, and when you normalize that, that difference became even more significant. So these data would fit with what we're seeing in the newborn CF pigs where the airway lumen is decreased. The, the third bit of uh, information came from a study that Tony Fisher did, and ha uh, similar findings have now been reported by a couple other groups, where Tony went back and retrospectively reviewed all the bronchoscopic reports from kids who had been uh, cared for at the University of Iowa over a, a, probably a 10 year period or so. Um, he looked at 97 kids. The median age on the bronchoscopy was 15 months. So presumably before a, lot of, a whole lot of secondary changes um, have occurred. And he essentially asked a, a simple question. Was tracheomalacia present or not? Which is essentially abnormal collapse of the airway. And what Tony found was that in children with CF, 15% uh, of kids had tracheomalacia present. If you compare that to a normal pediatric population, the rate is about one in 2100 or about 0.05%. And so these data would suggest that kids with CF had increased rates of tracheomalacia. So what did this look like? So here's some bronchoscopic images looking down at the, the anterior, posterior, left mainstem bronchus, right mainstem bronchus, and the crina. And you can see basically they were, these are screenshots from as the child was inspiring. And you know, normally the airways should stay pretty open and patent, but you can see this image here where the posterior trachea really collapses towards the anterior, consistent with this tracheomalacia diagnosis. Tony also had some CT scans on, on some of these kids and reconstructed the airway. And here's a, a, a reconstruction of the trachea. And you can see it's very abnormally shaped and collapsible compared to what we would, would typically think about. So did it matter if these kids had tracheomalacia? So if you look at their starting FEV1, it was significantly reduced. So 95% versus 114%. And interestingly, the kids with tracheomalacia tended to acquire pseudomonas sooner than the kids without tracheomalacia. So here I'm showing you acquisition of pseudomonas over time, and you can see the curve has shifted if you had tracheomalacia, and the same thing was present for mucoid pseudomonas aeruginosa. So in the remaining uh, portion of my talk, I'm gonna go back to the pig and talk about some fetal lung studies we've done to try and get at what might be potential mechanisms of this developmental defect. So the first thing we wanted to do was look at how early during 
uh, in utero life do these tracheal abnormalities develop. And so we did a study where we essentially harvested fetal non-CF and CF pigs at different time points. Uh, so for reference, uh, the total gestational age for a pig is about 114 days. So here we're at uh, gestational day 54 and 60. You can see already the trachea is significantly narrowed compared to the littermate control. And already you're seeing that abnormal shape develop. We then looked at day 69 and day 82, and not surprisingly, the difference in size as well as the shape persisted. We quantified that, and you can see that at all time points that we studied, um, you know, as the tracheal size went up in the non-CF, it also went up in the CF, but with a different slope compared to the non-CF pig litter mate controls. Because most of our findings had been present in the large airways, we next went to the stage of lung development called the pseudoglandular stage, which is where the, the large airways tend to develop. And so here I'm showing you histology where we, uh, this would be sort of the early pseudoglandular stage in a pig, day 36, extended it out to day 60, compared non-CF to CF, essentially took these histology slides and quantified every airway that was in the image um, and put it all together. And what you can see is at day 36, uh, we saw a significant reduction in airway size. This difference persisted at day 41, although interestingly, as more and more airways developed and more and more small airways were represented out of the total airway population, the difference essentially um, went away. We were very curious in terms of when is CFTR expressed in the fetal lung. And so here I'm showing you some, some really nice uh, stains that Dave Meyerholtz did. So again, we're back still at the pseudoglandular stage when the large airways are developing. Here's an airway lumen at day 36. Dave has stained uh, with an antibody for CFTR in brown. I'm gonna blow that up. You can see very robust staining along the uh, surface of, of nearly all of the airway epithelial cells. Importantly, we have the control to show that this is specific staining for CFTR. As we go through the pseudoglandular stage development, you can see we get persistent of CFTR staining. Continues, although maybe less than what we saw in the earlier stages. Interestingly, if you blow this up, you see this really nice spatial distribution of CFTR that's present on the leading edge of this airway as it's budding and developed, and you don't really see any CFTR staining on the backside of that airway. We saw a similar thing as you move up, here the airway has branched in two, and again, you almost exclusively see CFTR staining on the leading edge of this budding airway and no CFTR more distally to that site. By day 90, and now we're looking at sort of smaller airways here, essentially all of that CFTR expression um, has gone away. And again, really nice control with the CF and of course no CFTR staining. Interestingly, if, if you look at um, you know, sort of how the lungs develop, how lung budding happens, this is where a lot of the action is, where these FGF10 positive progenitor cells are, and you have a gradient of different factors along the length of this budding airway. And we stained for FGF10, um, and these brown cells right here are FGF10 positive cells. And so nice localization between where CFTR is expressing and where these FGF10 cells are. I don't have time to show you the data, but when we add FGF um, to airway cultures, it increases both CFTR expression as well as CFTR-mediated chloride and bicarbonate transport. So it looks like there could be an interaction between FGF and CFTR. To sort of further explore the mechanisms, people have done some uh, earlier work um, using human as well as some other species, fetal lungs and looking at liquid secretion. So you can take a fetal lung, you can basically chop it up, put it in culture, the ends close up, and they'll essentially grow and bud over time. And under basal conditions, if we take non-CF and CF fetal lung explants, we see no differences in growth under basal conditions. However, when we stimulate them with uh, uh, forest gland and IBMX, we see a dramatic increase in this fetal lung, both in terms of area as well as budding, and in contrast, you don't see that in the CF lung. We quantified that, so here I'm showing you change in lumen area on the y-axis, time and culture on the x-axis. When you stimulate with force gun and IBMX, a very significant increase in lumen area size. However, when you do this with CF, you can see essentially no growth in response to force gun and IBMX. 
So it could be that fetal lung liquid secretion mediated by CFTR is responsible for some of the abnormalities we're seeing. The last thing, and I don't have data specifically to show you, but we're also interested in whether or not airway smooth muscle con may contribute to some of these abnormalities. And that's based upon the fact that in the newborn CF trachea, we see abnormal architecture of airway smooth muscles. Um, Dan Cook in the lab had shown that CFTR is present in airway smooth muscles, and it appears to alter the contractile properties. There's this very interesting thing in the fetal lung that has not been documented in vivo, but when you take a fetal lung and you put it in culture, there's something called fetal airway peristalsis. So essentially the airways have this rhythmic beating that they do spontaneously. It's important for lung growth and budding. If you inhibit it with a calcium channel blocker, essentially you don't get fetal airway peristalsis and you don't get lung growth. And so it could be that CFTR could be disrupting fetal airway peristalsis, leading to some issues there. So what are some potential implications? I think the first is, I think, understanding if these developmental abnormalities are occurring, especially in people with CF, how does it contribute to the pathogenesis of CF airway disease? Tony's data looking at tracheomalacia and how it impacts um, pulmonary function as well as bacterial acquisition suggests it could have a role. I think it's also interesting that there are some species-related differences. And so I think we need to, you know, there's lots of area to explore across all these different species. What role is CFTR playing in the development of the lung? And I think one of the really important things, especially in the age of highly effective modulator therapy, uh, gene therapy, gene editing, is the timing of correction. We know that we're pushing earlier and earlier when we're starting these highly effective modulator therapies. There are now case reports of uh, uh, highly effective modulator therapy uh, being essentially given in utero um, where some kids were born and it, it prevented some of these developmental abnormalities um, uh, in utero. And it also, I want to think about, it could be organ specific. And this is my last slide here. And so essentially, um, we have G551D pigs and we can feed them ivacaftor in utero. And so I'm gonna show you some images from a g 551 d sow that was started ivacaftor at day 35, and the drug was continued until the piglets were born at 114 days. And look at a couple of the different organ manifests, manifestations. So non-CF, gut looks good, g 551 d without drug, you get meconiomelius. Within utero, VX770, that prevents meconiomelius. Similar thing for exocrine pancreas, prevents the development of pancreatic destruction, the microgallbladder phenotype is reversed. And interestingly, you know, an animal that did not have a vast deference now has a vast deference. The interesting point I wanna make is that the tracheal development or abnormality still persisted. And so the, despite giving ivacaftor from day 35 in utero, we still see the abnormal trachea when these animals are developed. And you know, if you think back to the data I showed you, we know these tracheal abnormalities are already present at day 50, and they probably extend back even more. So with that, um, I want to thank, uh, it takes a village to get these, these studies done. Thank everybody who contributed, and of course, to the funding. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Stoltz. So we'll move on to our next speaker, Dr. Uh, Camille Ere. Um, and she's going to be talking about uh, CFTR function in secretory cells. Hello, everyone. Oh, yeah. Thank you. So today we're going to talk about CFTR and secretory cells uh, and how they are related. Sorry, I'm trying to get my laser pointer. I have no disclosures uh, for this talk. Uh, the CF Cystic Fibrosis Foundation uh, talked about the path to a cure as being not a straight line. There are many routes that we can achieve this cure for cystic fibrosis. And that is mostly due because we have different mutations of cystic fibrosis, the CFTR um, gene. We have the mRNA that cannot be uh, produced in some of the mutations, and in some other mutations, we have an instability of the protein. So when we look at the different ways we can repair uh, cystic fibrosis, TFTR, uh, we can 
repair with the CFTR modulator, that's for repairing the protein. We can also repair uh, the mRNA. This is what we are trying to achieve with the read-throughs, the short nucleotide and the mRNA therapies. And of course, the ultimate goal is to repair the gene at the source. So here, how do we fix and replace the CFTR gene? Uh, we can edit the gene or we can transfer, transfer new genes into the cells. And for that, we have to study different delivery mechanisms, but the most important thing is to know which cells are the target for these uh, manipulations. So where is CFTR expressed? There is old literature uh, done with mostly immunohistochemistry there are two different groups. There is the group that says that CFTR is in non-ciliated cells. So here is from uh, John Engelhardt and uh, Le Semple, uh, two papers that were published in the 1990s and early 2000s uh, that described those hot cells that were not ciliated. Also, I want to applaud John Engelhardt for trying to do uh, the early days of in situ hybridization. Nowadays, everybody is using that. Uh, but at the time, it was very hard to distinguish which cell type was actually expressing CFTR. We have the other group that uh, showed that CFTR was expressed in ciliated cells. And those were nice pictures showing that we had a nice correlation of cilia, ciliated cells with an apical signal of the CFTR protein. So I invite you to look at poster six, 676. Nowadays, we have improved the way we fix the tissue. We do epitope retrieval. We had a broader range of CFTR. Uh, antibodies, and everybody agrees that it seems like CFTR is not expressed in ciliated cells nowadays. But at the time, it slowed down a little bit the research as we were trying to find viruses that could deliver this gene into the cells. So we used viruses like para, para influenza viruses that were genetically modified to have the green fluorescent protein and CFTR to transfect because they had a tropism for ciliated cells, like most of the respiratory viruses. And you can see here that these cells doubly transfected in green and red are, have a nicely response to uh, phoscholine uh, as bioelectrics are measured. The same is true with RSV that was also used. It has a ciliated cell tropism, and then those transfected cultures also responded nicely to false calling. So now that we know that probably with immunohistochemistry, we have suggestion that it's not in the, uh, in the ciliated cells, let's go back to a very powerful uh, tool, which is single cell RNA-seq. So when we go into uh, single cell RNA seq, we can distinguish different cell types, we can discover new cell types like ionocytes, for instance, and we can tell what cells express what protein or mRNA. So here I'm showing you uh, the, the UMAP uh, obtained by uh, Dr. Okuda from UNC and other institutions like Brigitte uh, Gombert's at UCLA have found very similar uh, findings. And you can see the ciliated cells in red. Here we have uh, the ionocytes, very small proportion of cells, about 1% of the cells are ionocytes. We have the basal cells in pink, blue, and uh, green. The deuterosomal cells in brown, and then the secretory cells in yellow and purple. So when we ask the single cell data, which cells are expressing CFTR, it became very, very clear that few ciliated cells actually expressed CFTR. Most of the expression, so again, uh, Kenichi dissected large and small airways and compared those two together. So you can see you have a large proportion of CFTR expressing cells that are in the ionocyte in the large airways, a little less in the small airways. You have a lot of secretory cells that are expressing CFTR, however, in the large and even more so in the small airways. The single cell data were combined with RNA scope. So one dot means one mRNA is expressed. And you can see here, uh, the cells were isolated from large and small airways. 
And you can see here that this FOXI1, the ionocyte marker, is showing that it's an ionocyte here that is very uh, highly marked as well with CFTR. These are not new data. Uh, ionocytes, we know, express large amounts of CFTR. And also you have this SCGB1A1, the Clara cell or the club cell uh, protein marker that is uh, also showing some expression of CFTR. So you can quantify those RNA scope data and you can tell the proportion of cells, a high proportion of cells, uh, ionocytes are expressing a high level of CFTR. We, but again, this is 1% of the uh, cell population. The more common cell type, the secretory cells, a lot of them express CFTR at a more moderate level. And the ciliated cells express very low level of uh, CFTR and the basal cells are in between. So I talked to you about secretory cells, but you have to understand there are two different groups of secretory cells. There are the club cells, which are more in the distal airways, and we have the goblet cells. And the goblet cells produce mucins, MUC5AC and MUC5B. So if you're looking at different, again, this is a paper published by Kenichi Okuda at UNC, and dissecting the lungs and staining them with RNA in situ hybridization or protein, we can follow the development of those cells throughout the airways. MUC5B is solely, is the only mucins expressed in the submucosal glands. MUC5AC is not found there. MUC5B is expressed throughout the respiratory tree all the way to the distal bronchioles. MUC5AC is mostly concentrated in the trachea and in the intermediate size airways. This histogram here is showing uh, the the repartition of these cells. You can see that we have a lot of CCSP. Again, this is the SCGB1A1 uh, marker, mostly in the distal airways. We have MUC5B that is also in the distal airways and also in the proximal airways, and MUC5AC is mostly concentrated in the uh, proximal airway. So this week, there was a nice paper that was published uh, from Burton Dickey's group. Um, uh, and described in great details the composition of mucin producing cells. So you can see here again, we have those submucosal glands, we agree with them. Submucosal glands are a, a, a MUC5AC, uh, MUC5B environment, but things get more complicated in, in the superficial epithelium. You have different goblet cells, different type of goblet cells, and different ratio of MUC5AC and MUC5B. So, and within even one single granule, you can have different ratio of MUC5AC and MUC5B in the same cell. So, what they concluded is indeed that MUC5B is more expressed as we go more distally, and MUC5AC is really staying more in the distal, uh, in the proximal airways. So here again, going back to the single cell data from Kenichi Okuda, when we overlap the large airways with the small airways, there is a clear subtype of cells that shows up in the small airways. So when we look at the profile that, of the genes they are expressing, you can see here that they are expressing MUC5B, of course the, the secretory protein, like the Clara cell, the club cell protein, and they are expressing CFTR. So those cells in the very deep lungs, in the small airways, are responsible for mucin production, also water flux to clear that mucus out of the lungs. So Kenichi and I, we uh, published a review very recently, about a month ago, where, and this is a diagram uh, summarizing these findings. We have the ionocytes, and they become more rare, almost disappearing in the small airways. MUC5AC producing cells remain in the very proximal airways. MUC5B producing cells go deep down further than the ionocytes. And when you look at CFTR production, it remains constant in the lungs. So there is something to it between CFTR and MUC5B producing cells. But what about the submucosal glands? 
So there is a paper from Iowa group on the submucos dissected submucosal glands and single cell RNA-seq. We also saw on Thursday afternoon Ruby Wang that gave us some preliminary data on single cell from extracted submucosal glands. So basically, uh, what these groups found that is that MUC5 um, CFTR is expressed in serous cells and in mucous cells in the acini, and is expressed in serous cells and ionocytes in the ducts. So I talked a lot about different secretory cell types, and for people that are not familiar with that, uh, with mucus or producing cell types, uh, I'm gonna summarize that a little bit. In the deep airways, we have the club cells. They are bronchiolar exocrine cells, and they were formerly called the Clara cells, and their marker is SCGB1A1 or CCSP. They are progenitor cells for goblet cells or ciliated cells. In the proximal airways, we have the goblet cells. They, ref they are referred to goblet cells because of their shape in goblet-like. Uh, they secrete mucins, both MUC5AC and MUC5B, at different ratios, and they present ab very abundant large granules um, in the cytoplasm. In the submucosal glands, we have both the mucus cells that produce MUC5B. Uh, they are localized to the acini, and uh, they also present a lot of granules in the cytoplasm. And we have the serous cells, and those are spread through the... Um, the duct as well as the acini. Their marker is the DMBT1, and they secrete glycoprotein and antimicrobials. So the fact that most secretory cells express CFTR, there must be a biological link to that. And we also know since the 1960s that CF is actually a mucus disease. In other countries, it's actually called the muco mucoviscidosis. So we have thick mucus in different parts of the body. All mucin-producing organs are affected in CF. We have the small airways, the submucosal glands. We have the crypt in the, the intestinal crypt in the GI tract, the pancreatic ducts, and even the genital tract is impacted in both females and males. So what is that link? How can CFTR being mutated in secretory cells impact mucus? There are many hypotheses about that. But here I'm going to try to very briefly summarize a very complex topic. Uh, so we have CFTR in normal airways that pumps chloride and bicarbonate out to the surface and downregulate the enac sodium channel. The, when mucins are produced into the airway surface layer, it becomes hydrated and expanded. It forms a loose mucus layer, and it can be transported out of the lungs. In the absence of CFTR function, we have a dehydration, a concentration of the mucus. Now the mucins are becoming entangled. Also, the lack of bicarbonate can compromise the expansion of those mucins from the granule to the external milieu. Uh, and also, lower pH can create increased electrostatic interactions, can create reactive oxygen species, and can also, because we have a lot of uh, contact due to the proximity of, of the polymers, we can create increased number of interactions in the mucus layer. So we suspect that all of this can be playing a role in CF. But again, if you paid attention in the first part of my talk, I told you that CFTR was in goblet cells. And now I'm putting the drawing and it's in ciliated cells. That's because it was written in 2019. And we learned so much since then <laughs> that, you know, science is finding the truth. Uh, when science changed its opinion, it did not lie to you. It learned more. And I like this quote. <laughs> so, uh, and the Iowa group uh, studied the pig uh, and noticed that the pig had problems with clearance, especially in the trachea, even if they were submerged in media. So what happened is uh, that they realized that the, the strands, the mucus strands that were coming out of the glands had a hard time detaching from the surface. And that was preventing them from clearing those discs that they are showing 
in, in many of their publications. And again, Linda did just like me. You can tell that I'm not the only one. She drew her CFTR inside the ciliate itself. That was in 2017. <laughs> So um, just going into that, we can look at the glands, and now I'm going to present some data uh, acquired by uh, Takafumi, Dr. Takafumi Kato from UNC, and he has presented some of that already. But just to summarize and give you a broad view about uh, CF and mucus in general. So Takafumi uh, realized that the proline-rich 4 protein is very specific to serous cells. Only, he could find only... Uh, PR4 in the submucosal glands. And when we looked at BEL from patients, normal patients, or patients with CF, we could detect the PR4 in the normal patient's population, but not in the CF, telling us there is something that is not properly functioning with the CF uh, glands. You can tell that actually, looking at immunohistochemistry, the CF glands actually express PR4. It just doesn't make it out. So going into a more um, detailed uh, phenotype of the glands, Takafumi looked at the person solid, which is increased in CF, correlated nicely with an increased osmotic pressure. And again, we know that the osmotic pressure can compress the cilia, which is what we found here in the TEM images of uh, the gland duct. It's compressed, the cilia length is diminished, this correlated with increased cohesion, which is the strength that is required to pull the mucus off, uh, increased cohesion in CF uh, glands, and uh, of course we have a retention of that mucus inside the glands. So here I'm gonna show you a, a picture of a submucosal gland from a CF patient at the time of transplant, and you can see how obstructed it is by mucus, and it's easy to imagine that whatever needs to come from behind that plug has a hard time making it out. Here, this is actually, uh, I colorized these images, but this is actually a red blood cell that at the time of transplant fell inside the submucosal gland. I thought that was pretty neat. So we are going back into in vitro techniques, and here we have CF cells, Delta F508, that are treated with ETI, and so we can confirm that we have a nice response with bioelectrics done by Martina Gensch. Uh, nice response to the ETI from those cells. We treated them for three days, and that was not sufficient time to change the pH to a normal level. What changed, though, was the concentration of mucins. It diminished. The person solids also diminished drastically. And what was very interesting for us scientists to see is to see, start seeing CF culture starting to move the mucus around. That happens within 24 hours after the treatment. And it's very, very cool to see because you can imagine how it's getting cleared out of the lungs. So here we did a very brief washing on the images. And you can see that in the vehicle treated cells, it's very hard to detach that mucus from the, from the surfaces. When it's ETI treated, it's much easier to remove mucus from the cell surfaces. So removing mucus, usually we remove pathogens with them. And so we are looking at viruses as well. And uh, here I'm showing you data of a GFP tagged RSV uh, in collaboration with Repicols. Uh, you can see that non-CF cells, if we wash them, they actually uh, increase the viral mobility as we follow that with the GFP tag. CF cells have a hard time transporting those viruses. When we wash them, they get a little better. This is significant. But when they are treated with ETI, it's drastic, the difference. And washing them actually doesn't change that much. So ETI is very effective at removing viruses. The same is true with SARS-CoV-2. Here, uh, we couldn't do the viral mobility because it's a BASL3 facility, but um, uh, we can follow the viral progression, uh, which is similar to viral mobility. And you can see that ETI treatment restored viral progression very nicely, uh, just the, to the same way as a very efficient wash in those cells. So here are just images of those cells infected with SARS-CoV-2. You can see the non-treated are fairly damaged, and uh, when they are ETI 
uh, treated and infected, they look much healthier. So here, uh, you can imagine how CFTR modula modulators being systemic, they can access the small airways, they can access the glands, they can access the crypts of the GI tract. And here I'm just showing you uh, just MCC data from patients before and after high uh, effective modulator therapy. So I don't know if with a pointer that's going to play. Hmm. Trying to remove the pointer. Okay. I'm not sure. Okay. This is before treatment. And so we are clearing the radio label particles. And after treatment, the same patient three months post high effective, highly effective modulator therapy is clearing. So that can be quantified. And you can see here that post ETI treatment, we have a higher rate of clearance of those radio label particles. This is part of the PROMISE study. So in conclusion, the single cell RNA-seq revealed not only ionocyte, but uh, the fact that secretory cells that are very common cell type in the lungs express high level of CFTR. Although this uh, cell type is common in the lungs, secretory cells present a high degree of heterogeneity. We have the club cells, we have the serous cells, we have the mucus cells, and we have the goblet cells. So <laughs> this is food for thoughts for gene uh, therapy. So given the close relationship be between ion fluxes and mucus properties, CFTR genetic manipulation of secretory cells may be required for proper secretion, expansion, and maturation of mucins. Gene editing and gene transfer targeting secretory cells may be challenging due to the intricate access, especially if you're talking about acini in the submucosal glands. Exocrine function, the, uh, and uh, de defense mechanism can be also a problem for those cells. But modulator therapies and hydration should be considered before uh, performing any of this gene mod modulator therapy, gene um, manipulation to remove the mucus. I would like to thank people in my lab, uh, Jason Wyckoff, who is here, a talented technician that is going to go into med school, hopefully. <laughs> And, uh, and people at the Marcy Collin Institute. And by the way, we have a position open for a postdoc in the lab. So thank you so much. So our next speaker is Dr. Ines Panconian. Um, and she's going to be talking about uh, CFTR regeneration defect. Um. Hello, everyone. Um, yeah, so I will start with the disclosure. I have nothing to disclose. I put the slide in the beginning. Um, no, but first of all, I would like to um, thank the organizers for inviting me. I'm very grateful to be able to present my work here today. Um, yes, so. The mouse, please. Oh, this one, okay. Okay, let's see. Oh, okay, so. Today I will talk about the identification of genes restoring the cystic fibrosis regeneration defect. Um, and I would like to begin with some um, previous data that was um, identified or was found in our lab. So there was a um, meta-analysis of um, different transcriptomic, um, transcriptomic uh, analysis sets uh, related to cystic fibrosis and other, um, other disorders, um, similar disorders. And actually, we identified a gene expression signature um, for dedifferentiation and epithelial to mesenchymal transition, so EMT. This is actually the process where um, epithelial cells basically um, lose their epithelial properties and acquire mesenchymal properties. Um, oh, okay. Can you hear me better now? Okay. And um, 
In the same study, we also found a gene signature, signature, uh, signature expression for um, regeneration and injury, actually. Um, but then we um, continued studying um, EMT and CF, and we actually found that um, although it's partial, but partial EMT is actually active in cystic fibrosis um, epithelium. And what we found is um, that there is a um, destructured um, expression of um, cell-to-cell -cell junctions, and we also found increased expression of mesenchymal um, markers and transcription factors. Um, so, which actually tells us that the CF epithelia are not as differentiated as non-CF epithelia. However, today I would like to focus only on the regeneration. So how does the regeneration work in a normal epithelium after injury? So we see here we have an injury, um, and then cells, basal cells actually start spreading and migrating, which is then followed by um, the cell proliferation and squamous metaplasia formation. And, and this continues with the cell proliferation, but then basal and uh, mucous cell hyperplasia is also um, happening, which then basically the cells re-differentiate into the cell, different cell types. Um, and um, to finally complete the full regeneration of a mucociliary epithelium. Um, however, in CF epithelia, it has been shown that the process of regeneration is either impaired or delayed. So basically, uh, the regeneration is kind of stuck in the steps two and three. So we have a persistence of cell proliferation and squamous metaplasia and also basal and mucous hyperplasia. So um, the CF, CF epithelium takes um, much more time to finally complete the regeneration, if at all, okay? So, yeah, how do we actually study epithelial regeneration? We use a fairly simple model, so we use a wound healing model, uh, which basically consists of three uh, processes. So, um, this is similar to what you just saw. So, basically, if um, the epithelia um, undergoes a damage, First, uh, the cell starts spreading and migrating to close the, the wound edge, which is then followed by the proliferation of cells to reestablish the epithelial layer um, continuity. And the last step is actually the full differentiation or redifferentiation into the um, different cell types and the polarization to restore the normal cell population. So, um, Still coming back to our, um, within our EMT study, uh, we performed a wound healing approach. And so what we did, we would um, actually seed cells on a permeable support and then would, them, would allow them to um, either polarize or fully differentiate depending on the cell type um, on, this mono, uh, on these permeable supports. Um, we would then perform a wound using a, a micropipette tip and after that, we use live cell uh, microscopy to monitor the wound closure. And what we actually found, so first we used CFB cells. They only polarized, so they were basically polarized for a week on, on the permeable supports until we performed the wound. And so what we found is that actually CFB cells expressing the wild type CFTR. Uh, so after 24 hours, basically the wound is, is closed. Uh, while CFB cells expressing the F5 hotel CFDR still have, a op have an open wound after 24 hours. And, of course, we wanted to compare this in, um, in, in primary cells, so we used um, primary bronchial epithelial cells. So we have here uh, control cells from a control donor, and, and we, also, we have CF cells here, and we basically found the same, that after 24 hours, the control cells, uh, the wound was already closed, while the CF cells still um, were in the process of closing the wound. So, um, yeah, so now we ask um, actually um, if CFDR maybe plays a role in this process of wound healing or regeneration. And for this, um, 
Ah, no, sorry. <laughs> I was wrong. So, first of all, <laughs> uh, we have already like a hint uh, what could be wrong in CF cells. So, what we did, we used the CFBE cells, uh, the wild type expressing cells, and also the delta F expressing cells. And we basically performed the wound, and we stained those. Uh, uh, those cells with seractin after four hours of, um, of wounding, and we looked at the wound edge. And in the wild type cells, you can see here nicely, um, nicely the formation of lamellipodia protrusions, which are necessary for the cells to migrate uh, into the wound gap. Okay. However, um, in CF cells, we could not see these nice for, um, protrusions. Um, which actually suggests, or we actually yeah, hypothesize, that probably those cells, they somehow lose the sense of direction, and that's why maybe, or most likely, the migration is impaired in those cells. Now we ask the question, is CFTR actually related to this process or not? So for this, I would like to introduce um, a new, um, new basal airway cell line model that we are using. So these are, they are called BCI NS1.1 cells. So these are basal cells, immortalized basal cells from a non-smoker. Um, non-smoker. <laughs> and they were actually developed in the Ron Crystal lab. And those cells, um, they, when we differentiate them on permeable supports, they are able to differentiate in all the multiple cell types. So here we have CC16, which is actually a marker for club cells, so secretory cells. We have ciliated cells, DNAR1. These are basal cells, P63. And they also produce mucus, as you can see here, MAC5AC staining. Um, this is the uh, quantification. I think it's important to say, I'm not showing it, but they also express ionocytes. So I think this is important uh, for yeah, nowadays studies. And more important, I even think that they uh, also express CFDR. So we stained those cells uh, when they were fully differentiated uh, with uh, CFTR antibodies. So we are using this MA, MAB3480, and we co-stained it with beta 2 bulin 4 for cilia ciliated cells. And I think, I hope I can convince you that also we think uh, CFTR is not expressed in the ciliated cells. So we should basically not draw CFTR in cili ciliated cells anymore. So I think this is very clear. We have CF, uh, CFTR actually in other cell types. Which ones? Most likely the secretory cells. But <laughs> we have not studied this yet. So, um, yes, so we use this cell model and we also perform the wound on these cells. So here you see day zero, we perform the wound. So these are like fully differentiated cells. So they, they, uh, basically differentiated for roughly 30 days on the filter. We performed the wound and we um, used live cell microscopy to monitor the wound healing. And you see after one and three days, then the wound is closed. We also included day nine. Uh, and this was because we wanted to now um, check for the CFTR expression. As, and as you can see here, actually CFTR is increased during wound closure and even later on. So after nine days, most likely there's already a redifferentiation into other cell types, right? Because the wound is already closed for six days. And still, like, CFTR increases. So um, this, of course, is not a direct link that CFTR is related, but it, it actually suggests that CFTR plays a role in wound healing and epithelial regeneration. And this brings us to the main aim of my research, was to identify genes improving f 5 with LCFTR traffic, but also um, affect the wound healing and regeneration. So for this, I have to explain you. Um, so a colleague of mine, Ugo Bute, in our lab, he performed an f 5 with LCFTR traffic screen. So he basically, this is not working, he basically used the CFTR construct um, tagged with M-Cherry and the flag tag to, in the end, basically to... Um, differentiate between total CFTR and to specifically have um, identified the CFTR with a flag tag that is expressed at the plasma membrane. And he performed this, um, this primary or this screen on an extended druggable genome sRNA lab library. 
which contained like almost uh, 28,000 sRNAs. And this is what he um, actually got from his screen. So what we see here is the, the treatment, the sRNA and the, and the Z-score, which is uh, for the plasma membrane CFDR. So basically, these uh, sRNAs here are hits because when um, using these sRNAs, uh, more CFTR was seen at the plasma membrane. So he calls them enhancer sRNAs. He also identified inhibitors, but because, of course, we're interested in the enhancers, so we, f he fo we focus on those ones. Here are some examples. I don't know. I'm not happy with this. Okay. Here are some examples. So here we have our control. Here we have total CFDR. And here he has some, um, like, five examples of sRNAs. When he knocks them or when he uses them to target and knock the genes down, he sees that he can rescue F5 or DEL CFDR to the plasma membrane. So, and um, for my aim now, uh, we were then uh, checking um, th those hits, basically using gene ontology enrichment analysis, and we identified that a quarter of these hits are actually related to cell migration, cell motility, and locomotion. So, which was another uh, evidence that there might be a link between CFDR and those processes. So, what we now did, we used these sRNAs uh, to perform a new sRNA screen, so actually a high-throughput wound healing sRNA screen, what we did is we um, used solid phase sRNA reverse transfection. So we basically coated the sRNAs on 96 well plates. We would seed F5 or DEL, see if they're expressing CFBE cells, um, and we would let them grow for 72 hours for the transfection and also to reach um, basically a monolayer, because for wound healing studies, you need a monolayer. And then we um, also, in collaboration with the mechanical workshop and the advanced light microscopy facility at the EMBL, EMBL in Heidelberg in Germany, we developed a wounding device that you can see here. Sorry, I will take this one. So we, we, we established this wounding device here that you can see. Um, it has um, 96 pins, and what it actually allows, it's allow, it allows the simultaneous wounding of, a, of cell monolayers in these 96 well plates um, to perform a, uh, a simultaneous wounding and a more or less um, the same size of the wounds, which is actually important for wound healing studies because if the wounds are not the same, um, you have great variations, and I think you can actually have uh, wrong or, yeah, wrong results. So th that was our aim, and um, so w when we performed the wounds, we took the um, plate and went to the microscope to do automatic fluorescence live cell imaging to monitor the wound healing. Uh, so this is how it actually looks. So this is our 96 well plate. Just after we wound it, and you see the wound is more or less the same in each um, well, and then we perform the wound segmentation for each time point. So I'm showing only time point 0, 8, and 16 here, but we imaged every hour for 16 hours. This is how it looks in real time, basically. So here, we, you can already see this white um, line here separates or calculates the area of the wound. And this is how, what we get. So we can plot. Um, the area of the wound versus the time. And then for the, the linear regression, we basically get a slope, and the slope is representative of the um, wound closure speed, which can then be converted in a Z-score, which is like an analysis for high-throughput uh, screens, so, and, um, which tells you, uh, which tells you um, basically the hits that you find in a screen, which are out of the mean. So the mean is actually zero, and everything that um, is above one are sRNAs that accelerate the, the wound closure, while everything that is below one inhibits the wound closure. Okay? Um, so this is what our primary screen revealed. So as you can see, we revealed all the green ones are wound closure accelerator sRNAs, 
So putting these sRNAs, uh, down-regulating these genes, um, accelerate the wound closure. And we also um, identified wound closure inhibitor sRNAs, okay? So using these sRNAs would kind of in, uh, what would inhibit the wound closure. And of course, since um, CF cells are delayed in wound closing, we actually want to improve it, right? So our interest is uh, actually in these accelerated sRNAs. So we took 20 of those uh, like robust hits uh, to further confirm in a second validation screen. So we performed the validation screen using distinct sRNAs. And um, so here you can see we identified, so we only see accelerator sRNAs. We identified nine sRNAs, which actually target eight genes, um, that accelerate the wound healing in f 5 4 dels after expressing cells. And um, here I'll show you some examples. So, so here you see time point 0, 8, and 16, and this is our negative control. So this is targeted against um, GFP, which of course shouldn't have any effect. Uh, our positive control using alpha catenin increases um, the wound healing, and the other positive control is the SICDC42, which impairs wound closure, what you can see here on the time point, uh, 16 hours. So, and we also identified, so here are three examples of genes, uh, of siRNAs that accelerated the wound closure, okay? And, uh, yeah, these uh, siRNAs are targeting genes related to phosphatases or ion transporters, uh, but also cyclases. And, um, yeah, with this, I would like to come to, to, to um, some preliminary data. It's very preliminary still, but uh, so, as I told you in the beginning, the wound healing actually consists of two processes, at least the ones that we are studying here, proliferation and migration. So we want to make sure, or we want to know which of those um, sRNAs actually are still um, accelerating migration. So we did a classification screen. We used mitomycin C to inhibit... Um, the proliferation, and basically from our accelerator as RNAs, from the nine, we found that four would most likely accelerate as RNAs because there was no effect anymore. But the most important ones is what we found is like five out of these accelerator as RNAs um, still under the treatment of mitomycin C accelerate the migration. So these are the most important ones that. Uh, of course, we will now uh, further um, investigate. So with this, I'm coming to the summary and the conclusions. So what we have seen, we have seen that CFT expression actually increases during wound healing in fully differentiated BCI cells. So suggesting that CFT somehow plays a role in this process, we established a high throughput wound healing microscopy assay. And using this assay, we identified as RNAs, which not just rescue the traffic of f 54 dl CFDR, but they also improve the wound um, healing in CF cells. Um, so, of course, there are still open questions which we have to, um, yeah, which we have to answer basically. So, will actually the rescue of f 54 dl CFDR traffic or the function um, by drugs basically um, trick after? if they also can rescue the regeneration defect. So we want to screen them again using Trikafta. And if so, those uh, um, targets will then actually investigate it for the mechanism of, of action. And then um, to see if they can actually serve as, as drug targets. Um, yes, and that's it. Uh, at the, yeah, in, the, in the end, I would like to um, thank my group. Um, in Lisbon, actually, and uh, in particular, Margarida Amaral, Margarida Quaresma, and Hugo Boutet for their support. But I would also like to thank you, the Advanced Microscopy Facility, um, also the Mechanical Workshop of the EMBL in Heidelberg, um, specifically Rainer Peppercock, Volker Hisenstein, Beate Neumann, and Sabine Reiter for their support uh, when I was there actually establishing the high throughput um, essay. And yeah. Thank you for listening, and I'm open for questions later on.
Thank you, Ines. And uh, we move to the last speaker. Sorry, this is taking. And last speaker is Esther Radar. And Esther is going to talk about the characterization of airway epithelial differentiation in response to restored CFTR function. All right. Um, I hope everybody can hear me. I would like to say thank you for this opportunity to talk about our work, trying to understand the um, cyanonasal airway epithelial um, cell composition gene expression and functional responses um, in response to um, uh, restored CFTR activity. So before I start, I would like to mention two um, uh, related presentations at this meeting. The first one is a poster um, by my colleague Dan Beswick, which uh, describes the uh, clinical and patient reported outcomes that are associated with one of the studies that I'm going to be talking about. That is poster number 571. And then I also gave another presentation um, which talks about um, a, a sister data set, the, the one that I'm gonna be delving into today. I know that that's past, that was yesterday, but I believe that is recorded if anybody wants to know more about it. Um, I, I think that that presentation can still be found. I have no disclosures, but I have a ton of acknowledgements. Um, uh, Firstly, a team of collaborators led by um, Jennifer Taylor Kauser and Dan Beswick. I'd like to highlight my bioinformatics collaborator, Dr. Um, Austin Gillen, as well as another set of collaborators um, that includes Katie Heisert and Max Seibel from National Jewish Health, members of my lab, and our funding sources. So I will start by um, uh, describing the problem that we're trying to address which is the extensive structural and functional defects that characterize the cystic fibrosis airway epithelium. And you can um, uh, see these illustrated here by the scanning electron microscopy images that I took right at the time when I was trying to get to know the disease. Um, these show the apical surface of the turbinates. And you can see the healthy airway epithelium is fully ciliated, looks like a shot carpet. While the CF um, from uh, the CF uh, cyanonasal mucosa from a single donor shows this highly variable appearance ranging from nearly normal to extremely abnormal, as you can see by all these angry full goblet cells in this area. So while these structures, so these, these types of structural and functional uh, uh, changes are what's termed as remodeling. Um, the, we know that these underlie disease symptoms, uh, they drive disease progressions. It's important to remember that they're likely focal, highly episodic, and variable extent, and there's some suspicion that some of these features may be irreversible. And then um, in my lab, we primarily study the CF cyanonasal epithelium, and later on I'll kind of raise the um, uh, relationship and relevance of that to the lower airway. Um, which has been a lot more intensively studied. And then I will also briefly mention that remodeling phenotypes in the in vivo airways are also reflected in primary cultured airway epithelial cells generated from stem cells that are harvested from the donor tissue. And here you can see kind of the corresponding air liquid interface cultures that we grew from these tissues. And we use this model to um, uh, study functional outcomes. And then I want to raise that this defective stem cell population, which then give rise to these cultures, could potentially have big negative impacts on certain types of gene therapy approaches. All right, so with this, um, uh, I'll raise kind of three critical questions that um, uh, are regarding remodeling in the context of um, uh, initiating modulators in people with CF, especially with established lung disease. So first, we still want to understand um, uh, what are the mechanisms that drive remodeling. Um, second, uh, we want to know what is the extent of improvement over time. And importantly, what I'm going to be talking about today mostly is um, to benchmark that to age-matched healthy individuals. Um, and then with this in mind, one potential way that I kind of think about um, correctors is potentially a means to repair or preserve structure and function until gene therapy may become available. 
And then finally, one thing that's um, uh, always in the forefront of my mind, again, is this question of whether um, transcriptomics, especially sinonasal transcriptomics, has um, uh, utility to characterize and monitor CF lung function response or CF lung disease in response to modulators or really any therapy. All right, so with that, um, I, remodeling mechanisms are, are, again, not very clear, but this little schematic has um, a, a little bit of an idea about how I think about it and how correctors may impact it. So in CF, um, we start early life with a dysfunctional CFTR ion channel, um, uh, which then leads to the buildup of this thick, difficult-to-clear mucus and starts this vicious cycle of infection, inflammation, immune cell infiltration, and then with time and turnover, you lead to a remodeled epithelium. Now, if we aim to disrupt this process by a highly effective modulator therapy, here I am talking about Alexa Tezaiva, um, it remains unknown to what extent this intervention um, uh, will be able to rectify the changes. So this outcome is what we're trying to understand. So in order to do that, um, I'm going to jump right into describing the two studies um, uh, that um, uh, we organized to assess modulator response in an adult cohort. So the first is a time course study. So I'm going to be calling it my hemp time course study. This is a collaboration with uh, Jen Taylor Kauser and Dan Beswick to test a hypothesis that modulators will lead to improvements in CF-related um, sinus disease as well as patient-reported outcomes. And then in my lab, we were um, especially interested in understanding the accompanying cyanonasal airway epithelial gene expression and functional changes. Again, I'd like to refer you to Dan's poster, um, as well as the number of excellent publications um, uh, that he's put out on the analysis so far. And then the second study, this is sort of our hemp versus healthy study. This is a collaboration with Katie Heisert and Max Seibold. And here we specifically wanted to, this is a separate cohort and um, uh, is just focusing in on the six month um, um, ETI treatment time course. We were interested in comparing gene expression and functional changes, especially using single cell transcriptomics compared to matched healthy individuals. All right. So um, I, my previous talk described in great detail the outcome from this um, uh, time course study, um, but just to very, very briefly use it to kind of anchor what I'm going to be talking about in the rest of the talk. Um, in this study, we collected um, uh, from the sort of right nasal brushing um, uh, RNA and DNA. Um, we sampled at baseline six months and two years, and we carried out bulk transcriptomic as well as microbiome um, analysis. And um, from the left nose, we used to isolate and expand airway epithelial cells for primary culture. So um, since the transcriptomic have already been, uh, transcriptomic data have already been presented at this meeting, I'm just going to highlight the key findings. So first to set the stage, I am going to define our key clinical outcome, um, which is a machine learning based um, analysis of CT scans of the sinuses. This is expressed as percent sinus opacification. So here you see an example of opacification, which after six and 24 months on ETI has decreased. Um, I, and in summary, percent SO or percent sinus opacification, as you can see, is massively decreased from baseline to six month, and it is stable from six month to two years in the study. And again, I'd like to refer you to Dan's poster, um, or if you're interested, the recording of the, the prior session to know more about these outcomes. So these um, uh, tables summarize the major gene expression changes from baseline to six month. You see a massive downregulation of um, neutrophilic inflammation um, and upregulated genes related to um, sort of restored metabolic processes, organelle biogenesis, including ciliogenesis, consistent with a mitigation of inflammatory epithelial remodeling. And then the last thing I will mention is that when we fit a mixed effects model to test for association between gene expression changes and clinical outcomes, we found that the gene expression, um, the genes that are driving the association were really strongly related um, to these critical inflammatory, inflammatory pathways that are 
very well known to operate in the CF airways, mainly known in the lung. Now we're observing them in the sinuses. So I want to share with you a little bit of the functional outcomes um, from this study. And I want to add the disclaimer that um, obviously the pandemic has been a confounder and a complicator um, on a lot of our work, including the way that we were able to um, uh, preserve and work with these cells right in the middle of our six month collection. So what I'm able to show um, uh, today is a subset of our baseline to six month data and then we also have a six month and two year cohort, which were again handled the same way. I'm not going to be talking about those today, but due to this handling um, uh, kind of a regulatory difference, I'm not able to show you full um, cohorts. All right, so then basically what we ended up doing is that these cells as they were acquired from the patients, they were expanded um, uh, and um, uh, frozen down at passage one. We cultured these cells in a homemade media formulation. I would like to make a big point about the critical importance of um, uh, commercial, homemade, whatever media formulations, because we have found that those had a massive impact on the outcome of um, uh, these uh, cultures. But basically, what I'm showing you here are just the results that pertain to differentiation towards the ciliated cell lineage and the overall appearance and structure and then the function of the epithelial junctions. So I'm highlighting one donor here, which exemplifies this trend. So we see fewer ciliated cells marked by FOXJ1 at baseline. The junctions are irregular. Cell shapes are large and again irregular. And a lot of this is normalized by six months. But if I am putting this together with an example healthy donor, you could see that these are still not as well organized and well differentiated. Here's a sampling of donors um, uh, where we counted ciliated cell number and culture. Just to orient you with the graphs, um, we cultured baseline and six month samples, both within the presence of ETI compounds, which we supplemented in the media. The impact of that is still not very clear. But the take home message is that um, if we look at, for example, donor two and donor three, which had this type of response that I described here to you. They indeed show more robust differentiation of ciliated cells at six months. We had a couple donors that just didn't really respond in any different way. And then we had a couple rare donors which both clinically did not respond to the drug but also failed to make a more normal epithelium. The interpretation of that is obviously incredibly complex. One interesting thing is that um, the TER or, uh, which is a metric of barrier function, um, across the board increased with um, uh, the six month samples. And we're not still very certain about why there is this um, discordance. All right, so then this really, really drives home the point um, uh, that although there are improvements, both transcriptomic improvements, as well as functional improvements in the CF cells after six months of ETI, um, they are still remaining quite dysfunctional. So this is where the other study comes in. This is our kind of hemp versus healthy study. Um, again, we enrolled, um, uh, well, we lost one of our healthy subjects, um, uh, 10 CF subjects that have been on ETI at this point for approximately six months um, with nine healthy age match subjects. And I'm going to be only telling you about the single cell um, uh, analysis that we did from the right brush and then a similar um, uh, primary culture study is ongoing from the cells obtained from the left brush. All right, so this is sort of the traditional orientation um, uh, that you will receive to any single cell data. So on my left here, you can see a UMAP plot that shows the cell types that we isolated from the donors, which represent all the expected cell types of the sinonasal epithelium. After QC, we were left with about 80,000 healthy NCF cells each, which are mostly made up of the epithelial cells um, uh, uh, that are expected, and about um, 11 to 18 percent immune cell types in the healthy versus CF, respectively. 
And looking at the distribution here of the various cell types, pleasant and the healthy and the CF, you can tell that all cell types are present in both, but there are considerable proportionality differences and then obviously programming differences. We're gonna delve into that in just a second. So for the sake of the short presentation, I will highlight some of the key findings that illustrate the um, remaining differences between the healthy and the CF airway epithelial population as sampled from the nose when these individuals on CF have been on uh, modulators for six months. So on this sort of top plot here, I am highlighting a well-known marker of neutrophils, and you can see that there is a much, much larger neutrophil population that remains in CF, indicative of ongoing neutrophilic inflammation, and these neutrophils continue to display their altered programming. Um, uh, this is going along with a continued, expanded, and high level of expression of pro-inflammatory mediators, both from immune cells and epithelial cells. So here I'm showing you the expression of IL-8. And then the two vignettes that I'm going to be delving into for the rest of the talk are related to the fact that we have evidence of an altered stem cell pool in the cystic fibrosis airway epithelium. Um, as well as an expanded squamous cell population here, this tiny cluster marked by involucrin. So this is what we're going to be talking about for the rest of the talk. So <clears throat> the first thing that I want to put out there is that we um, are sort of trying to tease apart evidence for a compromised stem cell population within the CF sinonasal airways. And obviously, this would have big implications for any tissue, but especially in the context of certain types of gene therapy. And this is sort of how I think about the stem cell population, because it's not just a basal cell. It's a basal cell that's a member of a stem cell population. And the way that you can think about it is that any stem cell pool is composed of cells in different cell states. And what's critical about it is that there's likely an optimal ratio in which cells that are resting, proliferating, and differentiating are maintained in order to maintain homeostasis and function to avoid disease. And there's already um, uh, good evidence from disease states that there is abnormal heterogeneity, an abnormal ratio of stem cells within these three states that may characterize disease and may fuel dysfunction within this tissue. And there's already evidence of this happening in CF. So this is a beautiful image from Carraro et al. in 2001. This was a single cell sequencing study that was done in um, terminal airways in CF. And this shows the conspicuous absence of PCNA positive proliferating progenitor cells within these end stage lungs, which was first detected through single cell sequencing. So similarly, um, uh, we wanted to look at the stem cell populations within the sinonasal um, transcriptomes that we have. So this is reclustered only to show our um, uh, um, epithelial cell populations with ignored the immune cells. And here you can see um, CF and healthy overlaid on top of each other are resting, proliferating, and two differentiating clusters of basal cells. And just very briefly, um, we sort of enumerated and compared the proportion of these um, uh, basal cell states. Here you can see the healthies and the CF. And then out of the approximately 40,000 basal cells, you can see that the CF samples contain much, much fewer basal cells. And this was normalized to the total number of basal cells that we um, acquired within these samples. And then now when we broke them down into the um, different subclusters of basal cells that were identified, this is already a good hint that there is altered heterogeneity in these airways. Um, uh, for example, we see numerically fewer but proportionally slightly more proliferating cells in this case. Um, uh, also an expansion of these differentiating cells potentially indicating ongoing injury repair. Obviously, Transcriptomics are a hypothesis generating tool. We need to um, continue to validate this experimentally. So we are very interested in um, and actively trying to collect the appropriate samples to validate these findings. Now, we've looked at the numerical composition. The next thing that we wanted to understand was programming of these basal cell clusters. And what I'm showing you here in these tables 
are the differential gene expression when we're comparing healthy and the CF counterparts for the cells that belong to these different basal cell clusters. And what you can see here is that um, uh, these basal cells in CF remain um, very strongly pro-inflammatory um, uh, and um, uh, displayed altered metabolic programming. So the idea here is that um, I, the basal cells isolated from uh, CF after ETI did not function as well um, uh, as healthy basal cells in primary cultures. These are the data that I showed here from earlier from the other cohort. Um, and again, this may have considerable implications for when and in what stage of the disease it may be worth um, uh, applying corrective gene therapy to these cells. So the next population that I want to draw your attention to are the squamous cells of the airway epithelium. This is the small um, uh, cluster right here um, in blue. Um, I, it's, it's a rare cell population that they're not um, ionocytes, um, I, but rather the squamous cells, which the previous speaker very nicely introduced. So these are cells that are characterized by markers of epidermal gene expression, immunomodulation, and cell-cell and cell-substrate adhesion. Um, uh, their, their kind of well-known markers are a variety of cytoskeratins, um, the epidermal differentiation complex in velucrin. And um, I, I want to highlight these are not skin, these are not cancer or precancer. Um, rather, they are reminiscent of these keratin-13 positive HILOC cells that have been previously identified in the mouse and the human lower airways. And the idea is that um, they are potentially a reservoir of highly proliferative, undifferentiated cells that may be needed for repair, but their functions are not absolutely clear. And my goal here is to um, understand whether these cells are friend or foe within the uh, CF cyanonasal epithelium. And one of the reasons why we're motivated to ask this question is because um, they're about five-fold expanded um, uh, within the, squam uh, the squamous population within the cyanonasal data set that we have. Um, their programming is highly pro-inflammatory on top of the um, immune processes these cells may already participate in. And although I don't have the um, full data here, these cells um, kind of bear the sort of most apparent um, kind of transcriptional senescence burden in the data set. So this led us to speculate that these squamous cells in CF um, may be expanded in areas of the airway epithelium that don't contribute to mucociliary clearance, but could be um, potent sources of pro-inflammatory and potentially senescence-associated signals. So one of the things that we've leveraged our single cell sequencing data set is to try to hypothesize um, I, whether um, factors such as IL-36 gamma, which are strongly enriched within these clusters, may be actually regulating the formation or the function of this population. Um, what I'm showing you here is um, these plots that are showing the IL-36 gamma cytokine, um, I, both in healthy and squamous cells, and then its receptor. And when we took healthy human cyanonasal basal cells and we expose them to increasing amounts of IL-36 gamma, you could see that over time um, uh, they started expressing this squamous cell keratin-13 marker. Um, so we are very interested in understanding whether this signaling is maybe involved in promoting the formation of the cell population. Interestingly, when we did this treatment in more mature airway epithelial cells, they were not as responsive um, when, uh, to the formation of these keratin-13 positive cells, um, uh, which suggests to us that potentially um, these cells derive from the basal cells, and this is something that we're confirming with trajectory analysis. And my very last slide um, uh, is the slide that I'm not expecting anybody to um, uh, really decipher, um, but we carried out cell chat analysis, which is a way to infer cell-cell re uh, signaling relationships from our data set, including between immune and epithelial cells. And we have um, uh, identified a lot of key um, uh, cell signaling relationships that um, include developmental signaling pathways like when to notch, um, uh, immune cell signaling pathways, 
um, as well. And then we're hoping to use the primary culture model in order to pick apart these mechanistic details. So um, uh, very clearly, what I've shown you here is that there is a considerable improvement of chronic inflammatory remodeling in the cyanonasal epithelium um, that we can see both structurally, functionally, and transcriptomically. It's a highly heterogeneous response. Um, uh, and what I'm hoping is that um, you will see that these um, airways are not healthy um, and that this supports the need, hopefully, for more in-depth understanding through con uh, continued longitudinal sampling and a rigorous comparison of the cyanonasal and the bronchial airway epithelium. And then I will also put in a shameless plug for anybody who's interested in moving to Denver and study cilia and CF airway epithelium for us. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Please don't go away. And I would also invite all the other three speakers to come here to the table. I think we should get some chairs. Yes. And I'd love to have microphones. So we have a few questions on the online app. Um, and then um, you know, feel free to also raise your hands, and we'll accommodate your questions as well. So we have about 20 minutes for questions. So in the interest of time, I wanted to start with the questions, or there are a couple of related questions with the most upvotes on the app. Uh, so the question um, that I'd like to get started with is, most of these talks talked about, most of you talked about um, you know, this uh, changes uh, in regeneration or uh, cell function, both in fetal lung development and in wound healing. Right, and uh, the question I was wondering about, and it's come through in some of these questions, is what are these? How do these defects come about? Right. So, do we have a sense of the cellular location of the increased CFTR, and uh, you know, are those basal cells expressing uh, like so wound healing? Right. Like basal cells are probably the cells that are proliferating, but we don't normally think of basal cells as expressing CFTR. Uh, as compared to like secretory cells, right? So where is this? Where do we think this defect is coming from in terms of uh, the cell type of origin? Uh, and along those lines, there was also a question about you know are mesen chymal cells somehow also uh, expressing um, CFTR, and is that somehow uh, important when you're thinking about fetal lung development? So it's a lot of interrelated questions, but I think. Uh, they're all related, and uh, you know, and, and I can repeat sort of subparts if necessary. But I thought this would start off the discussion well. Okay. Well, since I'm in, is this on? Since I'm in front of the microscope, maybe I will start to uh, take a, a first stab at that. And I think, as an epithelial biologist, I'm probably not allowed to comment on resident cells, so I'm going to leave the mesenchymal cells to somebody else. Um, but I think that this is um, a, a very, very complex process, and probably there are um, uh, CFTR-dependent as well as independent factors, factors that are secondary to CFTR mutation in an epithelium that has incurred um, a very, very long period of extensive injury and frustrated repair in the context of chronic inflammation. So we know that inflammatory signals like IL-1 beta, IL-13, if you want to reach to another um, uh, disease model, are very, very potent um, uh, in influencing regenerative and differentiative pathways. So I think that those signals, even if we're, we're thinking about them in terms of you know, homing neutrophils or something like that, they also impact epithelial differentiation very strongly. Then the other mechanism that I think that is really important, which then kind of brings me to the cell type that I think is really critical here, is the progenitor population. Both in terms of the programming and the composition of these cells, I think that there's evidence that um, uh, ongoing repair um, will alter the proportionality and will eventually compromise the stem cell pool, which is 
as we think of it as likely a finite source. Okay. Anybody else wants to? I mean, I would say from the, the fetal lung studies, um, I don't think we know which cell types those are or which cell types they're going to become. Um, obviously, single cell sequencing would be very helpful for this. Um, the other issue is, you know, what are those CFTR cells doing? Is it simply a fluid secretion phenomena? I mean, it's mechanotransduction at the sort of leading edge of that bud, or is the CFTR positive cell talking to some other cell in a mes mesenchyme? We don't really know. Yeah, so um, Esther, we look forward to your two-year study to see whether there is further reversibility in those effects, because this was six months, right? And as you said, given the amount of time that you know, these epithelia were exposed to pro-inflammatory factors, it may take longer. So maybe at two years you will see, but next year we'll tell about it. <laughs> I, I did present our two-year transcriptomic oh, data. Yeah. No, 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 I'm not, no. Um, I didn't show any of the functional outcomes. Okay. And the, the bottom line of that is that the clinical sort of cohort level take-home message is that there's sort of um, uh, kind of stable clinical outcomes from that six-month to two-year period. But very interestingly, transcriptomically, we see in about half of our subjects um, I, what we sort of call a, a reversal. We see those mm -hmm. same inflammatory pathways coming up. And then when we kind of broke down and correlated those transcriptomic signatures to the actual patient level clinical outcomes, we could see a correlation. Right. So potentially we're seeing um, some sort of regression that may be happening now that's actually unclear whether that's going to really translate into um, uh, worsening clinical outcomes. Right. That's, that's maybe that's do. year three. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, David, uh, I thought your presentation was really fascinating, but I, I have a question. Maybe you'd like to speculate. So, why you think, uh, speculating, um, the tracheal malformations are not reverted when you do the IVA in uh, vitro, in neutro, sorry. In neutro, um, could it be you should do it from the moment they're pregnant, day zero, day one, or do you like to speculate? Yeah, so, so we haven't done that study. I mean, yeah. it would be relatively easy to do, um, starting IVA after early. You know, we picked that day 35 time point because that was the, you know, the impetus for feeding the sows ibacaphter was to prevent the meconium ileus. Right. When we look at the appearance of meconium ileus in the CF fetuses, it's coming on sort of early day 30-ish. So right. that's why we picked the day 30, uh, right. 35 right. time point. Um, I mean, I think it suggests some programming has occurred at an amazingly early stage that for whatever reason is irreversible. I mean, it's, you know, it's interesting because if you look at you know, if you take a piece of trachea from a non-CF and a CF newborn pig and you just sort of look transcriptionally, there's not a whole lot of differences. Right. Despite the fact that structurally it's very abnormal appearing. Right. And so something has happened at a very early time point in utero that presumably is not reversible. I imagine if we started earlier, we could mm -hmm. reverse it. Or another possibility could be that the level of correction is not enough for the tracheal malformations, which are still good for the other ones, right? Sure, yeah, that's possible, yeah. So, so sorry, I didn't mean to. Yeah. Question for that. <laughs> How far are the budding at day 35? Is it what would be corresponding to the tracheal rings? at that point of developmental? Yeah, I don't know exactly how many buds are present, but there are some already, yeah. So yeah. It, it's beyond trachea. Um, and we actually don't have tracheal measurements at day 35 because the trachea is very fragile then and was difficult to sort of study. Right. That's why the tracheal measurements I showed you are at day 50-ish. Right. On a related note, one of the questions that came up is also, so you mentioned a little bit about transcriptomics for the trachea during development, but uh, the question was, is there a difference in the ECM proteome in the CF large airways that helps us think about this and perhaps in a way makes, uh, you know, the 
the pigs with CF more susceptible to proteolytic damage? You know, I don't think we've looked at that specifically. It's mm -hmm. something to go back and look at because we do have some, I mean, really the only proteomics data we have are from lavage and tracheal washings, but even that would be interesting to go back and sort of specifically look at, at those specific proteins. Okay, and one more question for Dr. Soltz, uh, and this came up from two different people, which was, so women with CF have a worse prognosis than males. Uh, and so the question was, have you compared uh, sexes among the pigs that you studied? And, and on a related note, uh, um, another uh, question was, um, you know, about the circularity of the trachea. It's, it seemed like there were two populations, some were normal and some were uh, very different. And so again, is, is there a gender-based difference for these? Yeah, species? so that's a really good question. We have not looked at that. And I think we, we can definitely go back and look at that. Um, It'd also be interesting, the tracheomalacia study that Tony did, I mean, the numbers were not very big, but I don't know if there were any sex differences in terms of a kid who was more or less predisposed to uh, tracheomalacia. Um, you know, there's evidence in other obstructive lung diseases now that sex, you know, females tend to be at high risk, and they've described this idea of this synapsis where the airways are smaller relative to the lung itself. And so, I mean, it's a really interesting idea, but we have not looked at it specifically on a sex basis. Also, I'd like to encourage, you know, participants in the room, you can also put questions despite there are no microphones, but you can shout and we can also repeat the questions. I mean, it's not forbidden to ask questions. <laughs> So other than gender differences, have you looked at the impact of severe mutations with the tracheomalacia? Are the more severe giving you more non-circular trachea? Right, so, so two things. Data from the pig, the Delta F508 homozygous pigs have a slightly less severe airway developmental effect than the nulls. And so that would suggest that there is, there's a sort of dose response effect, if you will. And then when Tony looked at the cohort for tracheomalacia, um, people with tracheomalacia tended to have more severe uh, uh, genotypes, tended to have more uh, higher rates of meconiomalacia. And so there does appear to be a, a correlation. And between G551D and Delta F? <laughs> I haven't specifically compared that. Okay. Um, okay, so there's one question for Dr. Panconian. So do basal cells in culture express CFTR mRNA or protein? And are secretory cells that express CFTR uh, contributing to wound closure? Oh, uh, good question. Actually, we haven't looked into it. So we haven't checked yet if basal cells express CFTR. And um, the other question was? So are secretory cells that express CFTR somehow contributing to wound closure? Uh, I don't know. I cannot say. <laughs> we haven't checked it. Um. Any more questions from the audience? Yes. Sorry. Oh, sorry. I, I can just, sorry, I can just comment uh, on that. What we think is that who takes hold of the wound closure are actually the basal cells. So they are the ones proliferating and closing the wound and then after that they differentiate. Sorry, Rick. Um, the answer is yes, their programming is definitely different between healthy and CF. One thing that, um, uh, sorry, one thing that um, I did not prove to be very fruitful is to compare the DEGs between those nasal macrophages and the sort of um, recruited and resident macrophages. Um, that are sort of being characterized in the human lung right now. So it hasn't really been very successful to try to identify them based on what's already sort of characterized in the lung. So we're kind of right now trying to characterize them sort of a little bit more agnostically. Um, as far as the submucosal origin, um, I don't think we recovered any submucosal um, gland 
located cells. We don't have any um, submucosal gland. Uh huh. You mean that they would migrate out? Uh huh. Correct. Yeah. So, as in recovering cells that would reside within a submucosal gland, I know we didn't do that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's, I think, a very reasonable hypothesis. Yeah. Jay. <laughs> So we have not tested that. It's the simple, but you're right. It's it's. it's yep. You know, we haven't. I mean, that study's difficult. You know, people had talked about doing sort of that type of study in a mouse, right? Because you could yeah. chondrocyte, smooth muscle, epithelial. I don't think any of that has ever been published to try and figure out who's responsible. Um, right. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, sort of the best we could do would be staining, right? Go ahead. Go ahead. So, transcriptomically, you saw that uh, the basal cell subpopulation that was decreased the most, um, or yeah, that was decreased in CF, was the kind of quiescent basal cell. So, did you assess the uh, proliferative capacity uh, of those cells in culture, whether or not they? Um, bottom line, no, we haven't done that. Um, uh, I think that that's a, a good idea. Um, one thing that's really important to note is that cell culture media in that case would be really critical because most of the way we culture our cells, that they're, they're very, very much pro-proliferative and then very pro-differentiation that may erase those signals. I mean, the way that I interpret what we see from the single cell is sort of an actively reparative population. This is why we see more of these proliferative and differentiating cells, which then um, uh, potentially leads to this, this compressed resting basal cell. Um, uh, but just because that they are, they are in that bin, just because they're in that state, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're good at doing that. Um, uh, and that's where a functional test will be important. Now, how well we're able to correlate that between what we see at passage one in the dish versus what we see in the small sample that we took from the tissue, that's, I think, going to be really critical. So I guess um, we're getting close to the end of the session. And maybe one thought um, and, you know, or one sort of point for opinions here. Uh, so as we're thinking about the next generation of therapies for um, CF, right, how do we think about the role of CFTR in wound healing or uh, development, right? Uh, and, and what does, how do we think about this at this point, right? Like uh, with the modulators, we've seen that just restoring some CFTR function is sufficient for clinical benefit, right? Um, and, and, and so, you know, is that the bar for the next generation of therapies? Or 
do we think about, it seems like we need to think about this more, but you know, food for thought. So do people have any comments? So from the modulators, we are learning with animal models that the earlier the treatment, the better. Mm -hmm. And so if we are getting into gene therapy, I feel like also whatever we can rescue as far as the function and as early as we can do it is probably the way to go, especially for those nonsense mutations. Anybody else? Like to come? Anybody in the audience? <laughs> yeah. I have one question. Yeah. 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 Um, Yeah, this, uh, that's actually a good idea to, to mix the cells. I haven't done this. Um, but I think it might probably not be directed to CFTR, but to some signaling somehow. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's, it's actually a good idea. Okay, so I want to thank all the presenters for the excellent talks we had this morning and also the audience for the questions and, of course, those questions that we got through um, the app. So thank you all and, yeah, let's... <laughs>